to Sancho Rose Boys. This is your co-host, Tim Amatuli. And I'm Chris Cote. We're back today talking about Ron from 1985. Real quick, could you tell me what that name means and why it's that? Because that was never answered. <laughs> <laughs> so there isn't an exact translation of Ron. It has a couple different meanings. It's just one of those words that doesn't quite have an equivalent in English. The best rough translation is chaos, but it could also mean rebellion. Weird title, but do not let that distract you from the insane, enormous Kagemusha 2.0 production value that we're going to be talking about today in Kurosawa's last true Jidai Geki period piece. Yeah, it's if you made the Hidden Fortress as Kagemusha. <laughs> well, really, it's if you made King Lear, but said it in Japan, because this is Kurosawa's third and final Shakespeare adaptation after Throne of Blood and The Bad Sleep Well. I haven't read King Lear. I don't know anyone that has. All I know about it is that's supposed to be confusing. Yeah, sorry. I didn't have to read in school, so I didn't read either. <laughs> this was actually a concept that Kurosawa came up with on his own and then found out while he was making it that it was basically just King Lear. <laughs> <laughs> so then he kind of incorporated parts of King Lear afterwards. But really, he started out with another historical story, kind of like we did with Takeda Shingen in Kagemusha of Mori Motonari, who was the daimyo of the Mori clan. He had three loyal sons. He's also the origin of the three arrows lesson that we get in this movie. One of the famous stories of him is that lesson, although the historical accuracy of that is debated. Yeah, that felt like a little fable thing. His three sons were very loyal, and Kurosawa started thinking, oh, what if those three sons sucked? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, did this movie. <laughs> In King Lear, it's not three sons, it's three daughters that get the land separated to them. Okay. So I, I can read for anyone that does know King Lear some character equivalents, but know that it's gender swapped for a lot of the characters because all the sons would have been daughters and then all of the wives would have been husbands. So from what I understand, Hidetora Ichimonji is King Lear. Taro is Gonoril. I don't know how to pronounce that. Jiro is Reagan. Saburo is Cordelia. Lady Kaede is Edmund. Lady Sue is Albany. Tsurumaru is Gloucester. Tango is Kent. Lord Fujimaki is the King of France. And then Kyoami is the Fool. And I want to talk about Kyoami for a second because many, many moons ago when we discussed the men who tread on the tiger's tail, I said there's a character in this movie, the Fool, that is exactly the way that it's going to be used way down the line in Ron. And here we are. <laughs> You know what? I forgot, but that is true. You did say that, and you were right. There was another buffoon. <laughs> Unlike the ones in uh, The Hidden Fortress, it's a single buffoon, and he's a lot like, more wild. He is very much so like the men who try on the tiger's tail. I did think it was a woman when I first saw him, and continued to think that occasionally. <laughs> yeah, so the actor playing Kyoami goes by the stage name Peter. So that's what that was. In the opening credits, they give the Japanese and English names, and they're all like English letters for Japanese names, and they're, one of them was Peter. <laughs> I was like, wait, so it's Tetsuya Nakadai and Peter together? <laughs> yeah. That's amazing, though. Good for him. Yes, he is one of Japan's most famous gay entertainers. Cool. And he has a very androgynous look to him, so he has actually played a lot of transgender characters. But he's mostly a pop star. Totally different conception of any character than we've ever gotten in a Kurosawa, but I really like him in this movie. He works for me a lot better than The Fool did in The Men Who Try on the Tiger's Tale. Yeah, The Fool. The Fool of the Men Who Turned in the Tiger's Tail was somehow antagonistic and, like, no one wanted him there. Whereas in this one, it's like the court jester. It makes sense. Yeah, exactly. It actually has a purpose. And he's the only one who can really make fun of the king. You know, The Fool can insult King Lear and not be scolded because he's the Fool, but no one else can. Yeah, yeah. You, you see that in other Shakespeare plays, too. And it's a, fun, it's a fun dynamic. Adapting Shakespeare, a big task, met with a big, big budget, even larger than Kage Musha, with $12 million. <laughs> <laughs> yep, still, uh... You know, like an American indie movie. 18 million less than Joker. <laughs> this took a long time for Kurosawa to be able to make, understandably, but Kagemusha won him the Palme d'Or in 1980 at Cannes. Yeah, and that gives you some clout. Yeah, it gives him some clout, but it still doesn't give him too much money in Japan because everyone was like, oh, now you want to make one that's even more expensive than the most expensive movie ever made in Japan? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure pro producers hate him. Yeah, and directors want to be him. <laughs> Eventually, he was able to secure funding from a couple different people across the globe. So this is also a co-production with France. 
Which is the case with actually quite a few Japanese auteurs like uh, Nagisa Oshima or Hirokazu Koreeda as recently as 2019. Given all of like the past 200 years of history, that's not very surprising. Kurosawa really saw Kagemusha as the dress rehearsal for Ron because this is the one he wanted to make even more. Nice. I got that vibe when I was watching it. You can definitely, I mean, if you compare literally every Kurosawa film together, these two are so similar in so many ways. Yes, yeah, so it, it's conceived of in very much the same way. A lot of drawings, a lot of time spent in pre-production. Although, we'll discuss whether or not this is actually a larger movie than Kagemusha, because so much of it does just take place, like, in the woods or, like, in a small room or something. But then there are certain parts that it's like, this is the biggest thing I've ever seen in any movie ever. So it's a tough act to compare. Because this is very similar to Kagemusha in a lot of ways, but also really different. I was looking at people, and I was like, people-wise, it's basically the same. It's like you if you took the same battles from Kagemusha, which were massive, and then you also, on top of that, just built and burned out a bunch of castles, which must massively inflate your budget. Yeah, and you also showed the battles. When we had all the horses, you know, that were maybe tranquilized, you were like, how are we going to have all these people interacting with horses? And I'm like, oh, just wait until next week when you're going to watch endless montages of people falling off horses, people getting hit by horses, like, while they're on the ground, like, crazy stuff. How does Kurosawa not have, like, a massive body count of dead actors and dead extras <laughs> from his movies? In the past movie and this one, the entire time, I was just thinking, like, these guys are going to die. A horse is going to step on them. That kills people. This movie is pretty autobiographical. Kurosawa really can be seen in Hidetora, the aging director who oversees this large kingdom and doesn't really have anyone to give it to. He excommunicated his loyal son, Toshiro Mifune. Yep. <laughs> He also endured quite a bit of loss during the production of this. Some of his key collaborators died during production, or actually his wife died during filming, and he suspended production for one single day for her funeral. That's classic Kurosawa. Yeah, that's cold. Uh, pretty, yeah, pretty fucked up, honestly, but you know, that's how he is. It, it makes with, with everything I know about him, it doesn't surprise me. Yeah, yeah I, I could have told you that, <laughs> and I didn't know. Also, this is Tatsuya Nakadai's last Kurosawa appearance. He won't be in the remainder of his films. You all know the most shocking thing about this entire film? That Tatsuya Nakadai was 53, <laughs> not 90 <laughs> when they shot it. He doesn't even look like this now. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, wasn't he just in Yojimbo and he was like 20? <laughs> Why is he like a corpse in this film? But, you know, it's because that's the role. <laughs> in the span of like a week, he goes from 70 to 120. I was actually thinking of I Live in Fear also, which is like applying this crazy old age makeup to a young actor. Yeah. Although I think it works a little bit better here. It, it does look artificial, but it also is the no inspiration like we saw in Throne of Blood. His face becomes completely like a mask by the end of it. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. I think it works much more effectively here. They literally paint his entire body white. And there's also a lot of no with like the costumes, the hats. Tsurumaru looks a lot like a no mad woman with his hair. Yeah, we'll get into it. Hidetora, the aging daimyo of the Ichimanji clan, decides to split his kingdom amongst his three sons, Taro, Jiro, and Saburo. Each is assigned a castle, but when Saburo protests his father's decision, he is banished and taken in by rival daimyo Lord Fujimaki. Taro's wife, Lady Kayade, begins to sow seeds of division within her husband's mind. Hidetora is offended by Taro's treatment of him and leaves for Jiro's castle. Jiro accepts his father, but he will not permit his guards to enter with him, as per Taro's orders. Hidetora's company arrives at the third castle and soon finds themselves besieged by both brothers' armies, but Hidetora is allowed to walk away alone. During the skirmish, Taro is shot by Jiro's vassal Kuragane, and Jiro becomes the new daimyo of the Ichimanji clan. Lady Kaede seduces and blackmails Jiro and demands that he goes to war with Saburo's forces, who are searching for Hidetora as he wanders the land having insane visions. Chaos erupts as the two brothers' forces battle while being invaded by another daimyo, Lord Ayabe. Saburo is shot after finding his father, who dies immediately afterward. Lady Kayade is slain by Kurogane after having Jiro's wife beheaded and revealing that she orchestrated this civil war as revenge for having her family slaughtered by Hidetora. The remainder of the Ichimanji clan is destroyed by the invaders. Sad. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why are all these movies so bleak? I mean, I, I guess he has every right to make them as bleak as he wants, but I was really hoping, I was like, oh, this will work out. No. <laughs> oh, come on, just let it. <laughs> I knew King Lear was a tragedy. I knew this was just like Hagimusha. I had a feeling it wasn't going to go up. Well, man, that's just, there's very little relief. I can't believe this Shakespearean tragedy didn't work out. This is maybe even more bleak than Kagemusha, honestly. Like, at least at the end of Kagemusha, a couple of the people get away and retreat from the battle. This is like, nope. 
every single person is dead. It is really like Throne of Blood, a morality tale. Because these people, and this is like really my only kind of complaint about this movie, is like, do we actually care about them? I don't really think so. I found myself caring about them more than the characters in Kagemusha, who I really had a tough time empathizing with. This I at least, you know, the, I like cared about the father-son dynamic to the extent that it was there briefly. So I was like pretty pissed at the end when they died, but like, yeah, still, they're all like caricatures. All their actions are so insane, everything is so fucked up and bad <laughs> that it's hard to just like feel like their character is going through something normal that you can understand what they're going through. These people aren't necessarily real. It's really Kurosawa laying out, again, kind of like a fairy tale almost, but like a German one yeah, that's violent. It definitely feels like... <laughs> Yeah, a Grimm Brothers fairy tale, but on the scale of World War II. <laughs> it starts out very sunny. We're on these beautiful green hilltops. It's beautiful. I love those nature shots. I'm all about that. Yeah, a lot of shots of clouds in this movie. We're going to have a lot of shots of bright white clouds during the day. And then as the movie goes, it's going to get darker and darker. And it's going to be taken over by storm clouds and encompassing the whole realm in darkness, kind of like he did with Kagemusha. The film like gets grayer, I think, over time, with the exception of like the colorful army yards. At one point, we were just looking at a hill. I noticed it was just very like much bleaker than the bright greens. We get introduced right away to Hidetora. He still has it, but he's you know he's old, he's tired, and he's like, okay, you know what? It's time for me to retire. Yeah, well, he like falls asleep, and then he like kind of panics, so he's like losing it a little. I think is how he realizes that maybe it's time to give it up. He's there with two other kings, and I assume his kingdom is the biggest, but they're kind of comparable. It's not too overtly said, but they are rival daimyos. It's maintaining a fragile peace. You know, this hunting trip is a way of keeping good relations with each other. And there's also the three loyal sons. And I love the way that they're color coordinated. There's so much color coordination in this movie, a lot like in Kagemusha. But now instead of having all those different colors for the different battalions in one army, now it's making the divisions between armies very clear. When I realized the colors matched the robes at the beginning and they had stripes indicating what level of sun they were. <laughs> like the first one had one stripe, the second side two, and the third one had three. I was like, oh, that's nice. Very clear, but also like it looks good. Yellow is for Taro, red is for Jiro, and then blue is for Saburo. We get the awesome apes together strong lesson with <laughs> the arrows. Hidetora has his sons each break one arrow and they do it easily. And then he gives them three of them and they can't do it. And he's like, yeah, see... If you guys just stay strong together, the clan will be fine. Taro, you're going to be the new daimyo of the clan. You get the first castle. Jiro, you get the second castle. Saburo, you get the third. And Saburo's like, Dad, this is an awful idea. Please don't do this. Yeah, we're all going to kill each other. He takes those three arrows and breaks them with his knee and his two arms, showing like, yeah, it just needs another force. And that other force, that knee is really going to be Lady Kaede later in the movie, someone who is coming right into the middle of all these men. And he's like, how dare you talk back to me? And then banishes his son. <laughs> he gets really mad at his son. It, I'll admit, Saburu comes across pretty insolent and annoying in that scene. And I was even getting annoyed. I was like, come on, just let it go. It is also a little unclear what everyone would have preferred to the situation if the Torah set up. Because what he sets up is that Taro is the like ruler de facto of the entire region. And then the other two get to rule like their respective castles. They were all like, oh, please don't do this. Do something else. But they don't say what else. They <laughs> the only thing they say is, can you just keep ruling? As soon as their father died, they probably still would have had something like this happen, but now it's happening a lot earlier. That was the only thing I was confused about, is what would they have preferred? Either him keep the rule, or do they want it to be three separate adjacent kingdoms? But anyway, he makes this controversial announcement. I bestow on the rule of the kingdom, and they can have their castles, and then I'm just gonna hang out. Let me just keep a retainer of guards, and uh, I'll go about my business, and I'll do what I want. Saburo is banished, and then Tango is one of the vassals, and he's like, please, no, your son is right, this is the grave mistake, and he's like, how dare you speak down to me, now you're also banished, but these are men that are speaking up not out of insolence, but out of genuine love and worry for what will happen, and that's why they will wind up being the most loyal, even though they are treated the worst. Yeah, at the beginning, Taro and Jiro appear pretty, like, princely and responsible, and Saburo kind of comes across as this little punk, but you come to realize that actually Saburo is right the entire time, and Taro and Jiro suck. Honestly, you don't really ever get too much of Taro because he dies about a third of the way through, but, you know, like, Jiro, who seems like, oh, you know, just like the cool middle son, reveals later he's, like, he's resentful because he was born ten months after Taro, and just because of those couple months, he has to live his entire life in his shadow. Well, yeah, his brother gets to be ruler of the entire kingdom and he gets to have a castle. Yeah, which he lives in anyway. 
Cyber does make a good point that by putting them in competition, but like unequally, you're immediately setting us up for failure and we are going to be at each other's throats. Yeah, it's just creating tension that doesn't need to happen. Like they're happy with the way their lives are. Let's have it keep going like this as long as we can. But no. Immediately, Lord Fujimaki, one of the rival daimyos, is like, Saburo, come with me. Come marry my daughter. Come stay with us. It's a little unclear what his motivations there are, but he is correctly identifying Saburo as the only one who isn't a complete asshole. We're going back to the main castle, and pretty immediately, we start seeing some of these tensions unfold. The problems start day one. It's amazing. There's no peace time. Hidetora literally gave away his powers willingly and then seems mad that he has no power. <laughs> yeah, he is immediately resentful. The very first thing that happens is Taro's wife is like going into the castle to take her place and Hidetora's concubines or whatever, his harem, is leaving and they have to like bow to her because she's the queen essentially now. He's really pissed about it. He's like, how dare that happen? And his advisor immediately points out, you just, you just made this the case? You literally did this. Yeah, it gets pointed out to him several times, but he never seems to take the message. He's so used to his life of privilege that now that he, even though he's willingly given it up, I don't think that it's even dawned on him how much it's affected him. Now everything is going to be seen as an inconvenience when, in reality, he's lucky he had anything to begin with. It's tough because they both treat him extremely badly, and he takes even minor mistreatment extremely badly. Yeah. <laughs> no, no one's winning here. He's completely overreacting, but also getting fucked over. Lady Kaede, we finally get her introduction and see her with Taro sitting on the dais. She gives some of her backstory about the fact that this castle that they're in now, the first castle of the Ichimonji, is the castle that her parents had and it was conquered by Hidetora. Not the first time that that happens in this movie. Much like in Throne of Blood, we now have another completely sociopathic insane wife that's going to ruin everything. Yeah. <laughs> Man, she gets to work right away. <laughs> she is horrifying. Yeah, I love her. Oh, she is awesome. Oh my god, she's one of my favorite Kurosawa characters ever. She's cool, but viscerally upsetting. It really is like a Cersei from Game of Thrones kind of character. A great manipulator, and she's really scary, but also manages to, like, when she needs to, look very vulnerable and feminine. At first, she comes, like, completely stone-faced, and you can tell right away that she's completely insane. But when she needs to do, like, acting to get her way, she's very convincing. Which is like really good acting on the part of the actress, but also as like a character in design. They're now demanding that Hidetora sign away the peaceful transfer of power with his own blood on a contract. Which, yeah, th this is a movie that feels very relevant to today, actually. This is basically what happened to Washington, D.C. <laughs> yeah, and uh, all the uh, consequences as well. Yeah, the first thing that they do, uh, Kayade, yeah, says, make it formal with your dad. Make him sign over basically a nothing contract. Which you really should have that in writing. If you're going to now become the daimyo of a clan, you really should have it written down that the man voluntarily gave it up. Otherwise, it's pretty suspicious. This is the first incidence of them being kind of annoying and him taking it extremely badly. Yeah, like the fact that he's sitting like three inches lower than his son, even though, again, his son is now the lord. And now you must sit below him. He's too indignant. He kicks over the candles. He gets so mad. Lady Kaede says that Hidetora's men are vulgar because of the songs that they're singing with Kiyoami. So he's like, all right, you know what? See ya. I'm leaving. I'm going to go to your cooler brother, Jiro, and go to the second castle. And then by the time that he gets there, Jiro's like, hey, dad. So um, I have orders from the Lord, my brother Taro, saying I can let you in, but I can't let your retainer in because they're naughty. He's such an angry person that he doesn't really have like a sound logic. He's also he is just going crazy. He'll have a lot of visions throughout this movie. A lot of this movie is just him going nuts in the field. He has that conversation with Lady Sue, Jiro's wife, who is another person who had this family conquered by Hidetora. Yeah, it's the exact same situation as Lady Kayade, but she becomes religious instead of vengeful. Yeah, it, it's two different versions of it, but it also is providing us a lot of backstory about Hidetora. We're introduced to him and he seems like a good father and as we're going we're like wow this guy really did a lot of terrible stuff as a ruler and it starts to feel more like this isn't necessarily look at the tragedy that's befallen this man it is like a chickens coming home to roost kind of story because all of these things that are the culmination of a life of violence it's very similar to the kagemusha thing in my opinion at the beginning when he's like you know you're as much of a scoundrel as me and he's like yeah uh, i am being king turns you into basically no more morally better than a thief Definitely, yeah, because this is a cautionary tale about the corrupting power of power. Which is uh, universal, and always true. 
Lady Sue is at least a good version of this, but then we are going to meet later on when he's on his walk, Sudumaru, who is her brother, who Hidetora forced to blind himself in order to live. At that point, Sudumaru would have been like a teenager. It showed that this man really did live and lead cruelly. Right now, we are feeling like, oh, he's like a crazy old man whose sons are tearing each other apart, which is sad. But it is like, Lady Kaede wouldn't be having this whole revenge plot if he didn't give her something to have revenge over. Yeah, there's definitely a more benevolent way to have been this kind of warlord. that comes back to bite him and haunt him in a thousand ways, and he knows that. Part of his like madness is, oh, I'm being persecuted, rightfully. <laughs> yeah, there'll be a lot of talks of the gods or of Buddha. We'll get a whole coda at the end of this movie about how the gods weep because we just keep killing each other and it is just an endless cycle of violence. And that's exactly what this movie proves. We're just coming in in that little moment right before the cycle starts over because there has been so much fighting before this movie starts and then there's going to be far more fighting when it's over. Now he's like, all right, well, Taro sucks, Jiro sucks. So I guess we'll just go to the third castle that Saburo would have had if I didn't excommunicate him. Then there's some weird shuffle going on here. It's not given too much dialogue, but it seems that these are the men that would have been Saburo's, and now they're just going to go join him. He has to go to the castle because there's now a decree that says that anyone who helps the old king will be put to death, which is like really harsh. You know, I bet maybe even Lady Kaede herself did that because it seems like a drastic step even for Taro to take, but Lady Kaede will give shadow orders behind people's backs. So it wouldn't be surprising. Yeah, because we don't see that order happens, it's like a little unclear where it actually comes from, or if the peasants just left. But yeah, basically, like, all of the villages in the kingdom are empty, and he's starving. Tongo comes and tries to give him some food, but his advisor, who has, like, basically been secretly working for Kaede the entire time, says, Oh no, you can't take the food, we, uh, we gotta go to the castle. Samurai can't accept charity under any circumstances. There is going to quickly be a siege from the armies of both the first and second castles. So basically, he's been manipulated this entire time to, like, have this exact outcome. We're going to wind up with, I don't know, is it the best scene Kurosawa's ever shot? Yeah, the siege is completely fucking nuts. Truly epic in every sense of the word. This whole movie is, but this scene in particular is like, there's nothing like it. It is outrageous destruction and death. Some of the most beautiful visuals I've ever seen in any movie. He's holed up in the castle with, I think it's supposed to be 30 men, but it feels like a massacre of hundreds, basically. You can tell his men because they're not in armor. And then the attacking forces are the armored soldiers of his two sons, the yellow armor and soldiers of Taro and the red of Jiro. There's all sorts of crazy techniques used. There's arrows flying. A lot of gunshots. Sometimes it seemed like the guns would shoot more than once without reloading, which I don't think they can do, but whatever. <laughs> and then pretty significantly, there's like a whole part in which it's silent or there's music playing instead of the actual audio. And that's just like the siege ramps up. It's this haunting, no like music playing as we're just seeing shot after shot of total massacre. We're going to see the entire harem use themselves as a shield to protect Hidetora when some people try and shoot him. We're going to see arrows constantly flying behind him as he's sitting down, just whipping past him as he sits still, like unsure of what to do. You can see his sanity leaving his head. You're going to see people lose limbs. This is also the most red blood I've ever seen in a movie. It's like Ace Hardware paint. Yeah, yeah. They, they had that in Kagemusha too, but there's more of it, like way more of it in this movie. Yeah, there's way more blood in this movie than there's ever been in any Kurosawa movie. I feel like the only people who don't bleed are the people who follow horses because that would have been too technically complicated. But everyone else is just covered in blood, always. And then the silence is finally broken in a part that I thought was incredible. It like, seemed like the siege was coming to like, its apex and they're about to get him. And Charo is right in front of the castle, and then suddenly a bullet pierces him right in the chest, and all of a sudden the audio comes back, and you hear all the violence. It's an amazing moment. Yeah, it just keeps going, goes right through his emblem. We get to see Jiro, who's also there, and then his vassal Kurogane is holding a gun, and he's like, yeah, damn shame that uh, a stray bullet from your father's castle killed his first son. Kurogane shoots Taro and says, I can't believe Lord Hidatora shot Taro. <laughs> like in the Aragon dream. <laughs> Jiro's move to usurp power has taken place, and the castle starts to burn. They start shooting it with arrows. Hidetora, he loses his sword as he loses his sanity. It's kind of just trailing behind him as he's walking out. It's almost looked like he committed seppuku, which they said he was going to, because why wouldn't he in this situation? It's like, It almost looks implied by the fact that his sword's dragging behind him, but he didn't. He's just, like, gone insane. I think he wanted to and then just didn't have the strength to actually do it. We do see a couple of the women also kill themselves or kill each other. 
they let Hidetora go. Comparatively, it's only been like, what, two, three days since this man was the lord that all of these men would bow for. <laughs> yeah. I just don't think that anyone could actually kill him. Yeah, yeah, like who's going to be the one to do it? And I think actually seeing his father, I don't think Jiro can fully pull the trigger on him. Yeah, they like very clearly want to, but they just kind of freeze. They're like, he's just going to wander and die alone. We've killed all his men. So, you know what? Just let him walk and you see the amazing compositions of the temple burning, a sea of red soldiers on one side and yellow on the other, and then this man just walking away from it. Yeah, the Mad King. It's so wild. It's really cool. It's an amazing scene. We're going to follow Jiro for a little bit. He's going to now take his mantle as maybe Kurosawa's biggest simp character. Yeah. <laughs> like We've had some real simps in Kurosawa's movies, but this guy really, man, he is whipped. He literally destroys his entire kingdom. It's fascinating. <laughs> There's probably no movie in which more people die over this concept. <laughs> Jiro now becomes the daimyo, and he presents Taro's hair to Lady Kaede and says, I'm so sorry your husband was killed. And she immediately knows, like, okay, he definitely had his brother killed. She's going to make the move to seduce him. She walks in with Taro's helmet, walks up, and she says, you should be the king now. You should deserve to wear this. And she kneels close up to him, basically hands it to him. And the second he goes to grab it, she pulls out a knife, jumps on top of him, and has the knife on his throat, screaming like, I'll fucking kill you. <laughs> it's crazy. It really shows us, like, Jiro really isn't much. He is easily overpowered. She says in that scene, you aren't fit to rule this kingdom, but you will anyway. She is just screaming at him. She's like, I know exactly what you're doing. This is the first time we see Lady Kaya do anything other than stare forward and move her mouth extremely little. And she is on top of him screaming with a knife to his throat, cutting his throat. Yeah, she literally slices part of his neck, which is like, ugh. She makes the move on him, and they eventually have sex, and she's like licking the blood wound on his neck. Like, it's like, oh my god, this woman is just crazy. <laughs> it's, yeah, well, she's, she is so insane. We're gonna see them getting dressed, and he calls her sister-in-law, which I, I do not like. <laughs> Yeah, she's like you can't. She's like, <laughs> she's like you can't say that, dude. We, <laughs> after what we just did, you cannot call me sister-in-law. She's like, I actually would rather be your wife. And he's like, I have a wife. And she's like, Well, I'm not gonna be your concubine. I've waited my whole life to get back in this castle. I'm not leaving it. So I demand the head of your wife. I can't live knowing another woman has had you. I need her dead. So manipulative. I hate her so much. Kurogane has been hired to behead my wife. And she's like, oh, by the way, make sure you, you know, really salt it because I want to have it. She's like, I don't want it to get ugly when you are on your ride back. I really want this head to look good. Such a pretty face. Kurogane basically tells Jiro, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to kill your wife because this woman told me to. And he starts like being subversive. And Jiro really won't even discipline him for his subversion. He, yeah, he like doesn't really take sides except for going with Kaede. Yeah, J Jiro really lets everybody walk over him, even though he wants to be the ruler. He's not actually built for it, because he doesn't make decisions on his own. He does whatever the most recent person told him to do. Yeah. <laughs> like, Kurogane goes and informs Lady Sue of what's going on. She runs away and meets up with her brother, Tsurumaru. Yeah, there's like a B-plot of Hidetaro and Kiyami and Tonga walking around. Hidetora has been walking around for a while and has been found by Tango and Kyoami. He's almost dead. He's looking crazy, grabbing flowers in the field. A field that's very much like the one from the end of Sanshiro Sugata, where there's crazy apocalyptic wind blowing and tall grass. They bring him to a shack that they find, and that's where Tsudomaru is. We learn his whole backstory, and he plays the scary no flute for them because he's like, I can't really give you proper hospitality because you killed my family and made me blind myself, but you're still welcome in my house. They'll eventually leave, and Lady Sue will come and take Tsudumaru, and we're going to get an amazing scene of Kurogane coming back with a head wrapped up, and he brings it to Jiro and Lady Kaede. Oh, this scene's so funny. They open it up, and <laughs> it's a stone fox head that was covered in salt, and he's like, oh my god. He he's playing it so comedically, <laughs> which I love. It's so funny. <laughs> he's like, I can't believe it. Uh, a fox must have been posing as a woman. That happens sometimes in these parts. <laughs> he's making Lady Kaede so angry because he's not even subtweeting her. He's just tweeting her. Well, eventually he's like, that even happened in this castle once. In fact, I think it's happening right now. And he just stares at her. <laughs> he points his fan at her. <laughs> <laughs> she's so mad. And she's like, Shiro, do something. And he's like, no. <laughs> like, 
we're gonna get quite a few scenes of Hidetora continuing to wander the landscape. There's some very Shakespearean, like, the king saying something and then the fool just giving rills back in return. Some pretty philosophical talk. Eventually, we're gonna get word that Saburo is leading the Fujimaki army and whatever men that were his that came to join him. And they're looking for Hidetora and it's like, hey, Jiro, can I just find dad and take him? Do you care? So n- now we wind up with like an army standoff where it's brother against brother. Yeah, they chicken with four massive armies. Yeah, like before we had at least two brothers that were working together. Now we get two brothers on opposite sides of the battlefield. And they're like, all right, we're not going to actually fight each other. We're just kind of showing the force because then also there is the Fujimaki forces with Saburo. And then also Lord Ayabe is on the mountainside. He's standing on like the edge of the property. It's very funny for armies standing, staring at each other. Lady Kaede is like, you gotta kill him. And Kurokai's like, please, I'm your military advisor. Please don't do that. He's your brother. There's no need to have war. And eventually Jiro's gonna be like, war's gonna happen anyway. It might as well happen now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Jiro's like, oh, should I, shouldn't I? Karugane says, don't do it. And then he goes to Lady Kaede. He says, I'm not going to do it. And she's like, you have to. And then he goes back and says, I'm going to do it. Yeah. I think they settle on an agreement where when Saburo goes to find Hidetora, that's when he should send assassins to kill him. And then Karugane is like, that's just going to start the war anyway. He's like, yeah, well, you know, what can you do? As soon as they're found, they send ambush unit. And then eventually he's like, all right, you know what? Charge. Yeah, that's very- <laughs> at that point, they hadn't intended to fight, it seems. And then while it's go- off going, happening somewhere else and no one's paying attention to it, they just start fighting anyway. He just, like, loses his patience with it. He's like, all right, you know what? Fine. Fight. The Saburo clan has the best fight plan ever. <laughs> yeah, they were actually prepared. It's so funny. <laughs> it really is like watching Katsuyori in Kagebusha go to battle, where it's like, this guy had a horrible battle strategy, and now Saburo's men are actually armed and ready and get a good flank on them. And you're just seeing tons of people fall off horsebacks and getting shot. Why don't we send a wall of horses into an impenetrable wall of guns? <laughs> And they notice that Lord Ayabe's forces are actually a decoy, and it's only a couple of them, and the real main army is actually going to attack the capital. (laughs) Which is pretty wild, because there are still, like, 200 men up on that hill. Oh, there's tons of men, but it it has to be a convincing military mirage. Kind of like the trees in Throne of Blood, you know, the moving forest. Saburo finally finds his dad wandering amongst the volcanic ash fields. His dad takes forever to finally recognize him, and he feels so bad for everything that he did. He regrets everything now. And then Saburo's like, Dad, I'm your son. I love you. I forgive you. It's a pretty touching reunion. And he says, the only thing I look forward to is talking to my son. And then very soon after, the two of them are riding horseback together, and then bang, all of a sudden Saburo goes limp and falls off his horse. It's really sad, and you knew it was coming. Everything is accounted for. Like, they went off, and then they knew they were going off to go shoot them, and then they send someone to tell him, but I guess that guy never got there because they don't know they're being watched by guns. It was so little that took so much. It literally kills Hidetora. He just, like, dies. Yeah, he dies of a broken heart immediately afterward. Yeah, he gets Padme syndrome. Like, (laughs) he just is looking at his dead son, has watched his entire kingdom go up in flames, and he just kills over on his son's body. I guess if you're completely insane for like a week and then you get your Sandy back for about five minutes long enough to reunite and then lose your son. <laughs> that's, you know, that's enough. I think it's reasonable that he dies immediately right there. I, I was even feeling that. I was like, let this guy die. I feel so bad for him. Yeah, exactly. They're just like weekend at Bernieing their old daimyo. <laughs> yeah, I also thought this is like weekend at Bernie, but with this thousand year old king. <laughs> Yeah, because he does look so different by the end of this. He's just totally disheveled, and his face is barely moving. His eyes are so sunken in black, and his skin is totally white. Ugh. His hair has grown to be like eight times the length. As this is happening, Saburo's men are winning the fight against this significantly larger army. It looks like they took Jiro and Taro's armies and like gave them all red gear, which they for some reason had extra of. <laughs> and now they have this combined massive force. And they beat them just by running into the trees, shooting them when they come over, and then chasing them just enough to bait them back. And then when they come back, they shoot them again. You know, Jiro really gets played like a fool. Everyone has to retreat to the castle, which is now under siege. And in the midst of all of it, one guy on horseback comes in with a severed head wrapped up in cloth. And Kurogane sees it and he's like, wait, wait, hell, hold up, wait a minute. He takes it and he opens it up. We don't see the head, but we do see that it has Lady Sue's kimono. Kurogane's pissed. We see him go inside, and Jiro tries to stop him for a second. He's like, I take orders from you. I don't take orders from her. 
She's just sitting there looking solid and not moving. And he's like, you fox woman, look what your scheming has done. You've destroyed the entire clan. She's like, yeah, that's exactly what I wanted. This clan destroyed my family. I've done everything I've ever wanted. And is it the most satisfying end to a villain that you've ever seen? Yep. She's been oh so evil God. and so awful. And she's just sitting there like, I got everything I wanted. So Kirigana cuts her head off and then the blood splatter is all the way up the wall. It's very much so like the end of Sanjuro. It is a vicious one take, and I'll talk more about that later, but totally great. And then Kurogane's like, all right, Jiro, um, prepare to die, I guess, because we're not winning this fight. Yeah, they like, they like try to leave for like five seconds, and then someone comes in and is like, yeah, it's, it's over, we're done. Yep, time to die, and then we get the funeral for Saburo and Hidetora, and now we get to see another castle burning after there's been some proselytizing about how the gods weep and how evil men are. We just see Tsutamaru alone, blind on the ruins of his family's castle, which is where Lady Sue was earlier with him. He's holding her scroll of the Buddha, who was there to protect her, and he drops it when he almost falls off the edge of something with his walking stick. And, you know, it's just, like, looking sad, and it's in darkness. It should be something that's bright and optimistic, and it is defeated. And move far away from him, and we close out. It's a end. Finn. <laughs> More credits. Yeah, it's a bleak ending, but a good movie. Very. I'm going to hop right into my favorite shot because it is the decapitation. We don't see the decapitation. I think it's a really cool way of doing it. Yeah, it happens right in front of you, but it's behind someone. Yeah, and it really is everything about how your mind fills in the gaps. So it's a long shot through a doorway as the interrogator, and then as Kurugane finally goes up for the swing, it dollies inward and onto him more, so we just barely lose sight of Lady Kaede right before he slices, and from what's probably right behind her is this enormous splash of red blood on the wall. You can't even see Jiro's reaction to it, but just the way that his body goes stiff and the way that Kurugane holds his facial expression... It's one sole cathartic moment in what is otherwise just utter tragedy. It's not like something like you're like, oh, that was awesome. It's like, oh my God. Like it, it really is like a breathtaking moment. I like that. Unlike Sanjuro, where there's no blood the entire time and then a huge burst at the end, this entire movie is bloody and that still stands out as like a shocking moment. Yeah, exactly. All the blood before it has not lessened the impact of seeing it. So my shot is uh, a little bit different. I do like the shot itself, but it's more about what the shot represents. My shot is when Saburo realizes that Lord Ayabe's troops have come to support him. So up in the foreground, there's a couple of Saburo's troops, his two right-hand men. And they're, you know, maybe a couple feet away from the camera. And then like two miles in the background is thousands of men up on this hill. And all I could think was the amount of effort that went into making this goddamn movie, like Kurosawa, the fact that he was able to facilitate this happening, thousands of men miles away from where the camera even is, all doing this coordinated march and movement with just a few things in the foreground. And it looks beautiful. And it's just insane to think that he could pull any of this off. And it makes me think of the Battle of Naboo from Phantom Menace. Because of the, yeah. <laughs> the, the, or, or the uh, Windows XP uh, desktop. Many things that I love in that image, but yeah, absolutely. The amount of effort and this man in his 70s able to create such a powerful vision and continue to outdo himself after decades of his career, it's truly remarkable. For me, this is one of, I think, his most flawless films. It's really difficult for me to find problems with it because everything feels important. It feels, to me, the right length, which is tough because he does like to hold on things for a very long time in a lot of his movies. But here, the things that he's holding on are just things that you've never seen him do before and helps him really build this whole atmosphere of chaos. If that was the title that they wound up going with for this movie, it would make sense because it really is chaos. It's a great look at a royal family done differently than Kagemusha, but I think just as effectively... I think it's an excellent morality tale, a great Shakespeare adaptation. I think his best Shakespeare adaptation. I love the armor and all the set design. I mean, the production design, like in Kagemusha, is so good. It's a film full of incredible images. And I'm going to give it a perfect score of 10 out of 10. Uh, I like this one a lot. I definitely liked it more than Kagemusha, which I thought was very impressive. And this movie was very impressive, but even more somehow, because he made it even bigger. And I, I found the story more engaging than Kagemusha's. The thing is, just like, this is not my kind of movie. 
the sum total of this, which is this insane, crazy, epic feat to pull off, is still to me like not more enjoyable to watch than something like Redbeard, which is a tight, focused film in a small setting, which is just the kind of thing that I prefer. Uh, so it's tough for me to find criticisms. I just know I enjoyed it at the level of a nine, which is what I'm going to give it. You know, still incredible, <laughs> incredible movie. Yeah, still something that most filmmakers would aspire to. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was just watching it. I, just, I guess I can't get over like, why? <laughs> this is insane. And I'm amazed they did it and good for him. And it's, you know, a monument of a film. Is this actually bigger than Kagemusha? Kagemusha was so large, had so many people in so many different areas doing things. But here, the things that he's able to actually do are bigger. The burning down of the castles is insane. Do they build those just to burn them down? They're real. Ca- it's a real castle. That is a real castle that is burning on so how, film. It's not a miniature. So how, why is he allowed to burn? <laughs> well, I, it's, it's crazy. There's these beautiful castles that are massive, and they actually just burn them down on screen with you seeing them. Reminding me of The Sacrifice by Tarkovsky, but that's just a house. This makes The Sacrifice look like chump change. Sacrifice is like, oh, we burned down one house, and we had to get it right, and then we didn't. This was like, we're going to burn down this enormous temple, and you have to do it right. <laughs> we're going to burn down more than one massive castle. <laughs> Kage Musha, I think, has a lot more scenes that have a lot more going on in them, where this movie has a lot of small scenes with just a couple characters. But again, there's nothing like the siege. So I'm probably going to have to say that just off of the siege alone, it's a bigger movie. Because the main battle in Kage Musha, besides the end battle, which you don't actually see except for the aftermath. Yeah, just a lot of people rocking around in Kage Musha mostly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Even if it's more it's people. It's just a lot of shots of people running and people getting shot by people that you don't see. Here, you do see it. You see all of it. Yeah, no, I think it's bigger than Kagemusha and more impressive as a whole. Just barely, but yes. Yeah, just barely, but yeah, you know, maybe it's two million more impressive than <laughs> Inflation, man. Twelve million really used to get you far. Oh my god. In this movie today, it would cost 600 million <laughs> to do. And it wouldn't look as good. Oh, it would look like shit. I love the film stock. Just everything about this movie. I, I've always had it as one of my absolute favorites by him. And every time I watch it, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's why, because it's just so well structured. And I find all the characters like, you know, like I just love looking at them. I love every character you can see in costumes and the things that Kurosawa does here. It's really remarkable. It's definitely the high point of his career in terms of how big his movies can ever get. I've heard about his late stage masterpieces. I had no idea what they would be. I don't think they'd be massive, crazy industrial scale projects. I thought they would just be very good small films, but no. They are these blowout movies, Kagemusha and Ron, and they're amazing. Definitely don't expect another Ron in our very few remaining movies. We are almost done. <laughs> yeah, you can't, you can't make more than one Ron, even though he did. Next week, we're going to be back for a really different type of movie, Dreams, which is going to be a collection of short stories based on Kurosawa's actual dreams. Cool. That would be something. Really, it's going to be like us discussing like eight short films or something like that. Yeah, whatever. Should be fun. We'll see how we'll do it. But I will tell you one thing to get you excited for next week. There is a actor in this movie that is going to blow your mind when you see him. Okay. I'm excited. Whoever you think it is, it's not. So get ready. If anyone wants to hear who that actor is, tune in next week for Dreams. Dreams.